Now, from pouting kids with custard on breakfast TV to hosting the world's biggest ever game show, you won't need to phone a friend to recognise my next guest, Chris Tarrant. One of Britain's most loved telly presenters with an illustrious career spanning a staggering 50 yes, all right. years. <laughs> yes, my next guest is very, very old. <laughs> It's hanging by a thread. But Chris, it's been a colourful one. It's, it's been a colourful, colourful one. Because Chris, of course, became a rising star when he burst onto British TV screens in the 70s, hosting the Anarchic Tiswas, which saw Saturday mornings descend into chaos. Look at Buckets of water, wacky comedy and bemused famous guests. Then Capital Breakfast, of course, almost two decades before the iconic Who Wants to Be a Millionaire chair became his life for 16 years. It was an instant overnight hit that saw him witness the highs of contestants' life-changing wins, the lows of losses. Ooh, look. And who is it? The famous, infamous, coughing major. But would Chris, who is promoting his brilliant new book, It's Not a Proper Job, have been able to have such an illustrious and fun career in this current era of woke PC madness. Well, Chris joins me now. I have to say, Chris, I'm so angry with you, right? Because Why, this is what your book. Now? Well, I was up until 4 a.m. reading this last night because I... You didn't. I, you just skipped through no, it. No, no, no. I didn't. I, 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 I read it all quickly. I'm a very fast reader. Yeah. But I loved it because this actually isn't an autobiography. There's no, no boring no. bits, right? It's the highlights it's of the your career. Bits. Yeah, and it's In so a very fun. Silly life. It is good fun. But I you've done it. so much, and it did get me thinking, Chris. Well, it actually got me thinking two things. Number one, I'm very jealous that you got to work in that era that really was the peak of wild I think, I TV. I think we had more fun as well. Well, yeah, because you couldn't do so no. much of what you no. did It's true. Then. I was looking at those clips of Tiswell's. <laughs> yes, exactly. Children's television producer, I don't <laughs> think so. Yeah. But in, we had the best time, and it was completely harmless. You know, there's no... We weren't being political, we weren't being remotely intellectual, it was just fun. Mike Palin used to come on quite a lot and he said, I love it because it's silly and silly is good. It and is. Silly's always suited me. But we're in these really interesting times now, aren't we, where TV presenters have to second guess everything, especially if you're on the BBC, you've, you've got to watch your words. Are you watching every word? No? I mean, I'm not, but we're the anti-woke, anti-cancel exactly. culture channel. Exactly. So here I'm but safe. Two of my kids are on radio and they're both yeah. great and they're good kids and they're doing very well, but I just feel they're not getting the, the fun we had, you know, because, I mean, like, Toby's on X a lot and he's mm. very good, but he almost has to watch, even on that station, has to watch every word he says. It's like, oh. But you do now. Yeah. Because people lose their jobs for saying one thing I know. wrong. I know. I know. We're not a very forgiving society anymore. I don't think we're forgiving at all, actually. I mean, and certainly now I would, I would not be forgiven for Tiz Was. No. Tiz Was was such a hoot. Yeah. And it, it was nothing clever. Was nothing, I mean, we wrote scripts and things, but, you know, we had a ball. And all the, everybody, everybody in every band in Britain at that time, McCartney, Roger Daltrey, Queen, they all came on because they had a great laugh. And it was you just know. fun. It was great fun, you know, and occasionally we... I mean, I remember once that somebody said, I saw a child crying on this show. You think, well, yeah, I mean, go to a kid's party, kids cry, you know, they, get, they fall over and stuff. We had this famous incident where, for one... <laughs> some of the things... This is my producer's hat, and I thought, that'd be a good idea. I decided we'd have a celebrity cage. Instead of just the yes. normal members of the public, we pelted it with rubbish. Let's get a load of celebrities in, get a bit of press and stuff. So we got um, status quo. Uh, a rock band from America called Goldie and the Gingerbreads. Um, we had Cozy Powell and Co. from Rainbow. Uh, Lemmy from Motet. Oh, and the late splendid John Peel. And I think one or two others. This cage was rammed. <laughs> so we, we pelted them with the usual rubbish and whatever. And then I'm doing a sketch with Lenny. And I suddenly thought, that's marijuana. I am ostensibly the producer of a children's program going out live, and somebody has spoken <laughs> a split. Dope. Did you find out who it was? Yes. Um, I mean, basically, Lenny and I were doing a sketch. He was dressed up as a waiter or something. I went, I know what this is. And Lenny's like, Why, where are you going? And I went, forget it. And just pelted the cage with water and buckets, and the offending item was put out. I, I can't tell you who it was. I think it was because we Rick were Parfitt. in... <laughs> oh, God, I didn't even need to push. I was going to let you get away with that. I think it's because we were, or you were in a pre-social media era. I mean, you know, you talk about the royals in this book and mm. Princess Diana was, was a big fan of mm. Capital Radio. I didn't mm. realise that. And, and what, she would sometimes just Princess pop in. Princess Diana wore a Tiswas T-shirt. Did she? <laughs> she did. We sent her one. She put it on for some <laughs> photo call. It's cool. But the difference is now 
is that the moment that you come off television, you are picked apart on social media. The presenters get that immediately to their phones, but perhaps even more, I, I think, worryingly, the producers read everything that's said and they're so worried about the slightest hint of outrage. They actually run away from outrage rather than running into it. I think they probably do. And that's also why a lot of programmes now are terribly predictable and sane and pretty damn dull, actually. So would you yeah. say the golden age of British television is behind us? No, there's always going to be talent to coming it? up, you know, and, and talent will burst through and so on. But it's, it's, it's a weird time at the moment because everybody's, you know, literally looking over their shoulder. If I was doing stuff still, I mean, I'm still working, but I'm not doing a fat lot. I quite like it. Because COVID sort of stopped all our filming yeah. and stuff. And that was free. We were going around the world doing railways and things. That was completely free. There was no wokery on that. We had a great time, you know. So it is still possible? Yeah, of course it is. If you are who you are, you know, you just, you just do your thing and go, well, it's him, I'm sorry, but he's so old, he doesn't understand you know, the rules. But, but it's, you know, it's good. It's good, that. I mean, live radio for me, 17, 18 years, early morning on Capital Radio, that was the best fun. I mean, I had such a ball. You know, getting out of bed was not great, but it was just fantastic. It was such a laugh. Yeah, no, I do worry. Now, I worry that we've taken the fun out of a lot of We've taken the bars out of all the buildings. Yeah. You know. Because actually that's something that comes up in your book a lot. You say some, yeah. of, some of the best ideas actually came from getting drunk with creative people at, not getting at the drunk, bars. Dan, not getting drunk. Okay. But, Having I mean, a few. I, was, Having I, a few. I, I never went on television drunk. But we no, this is after TV, though, right? This is after oh, the show. During, before, whatever. You know. Yeah, but, but, I mean, we never went on drunk. We didn't do that. But we certainly topped up during the day and stuff. People now go, we used to go for lunch. A drink. You remember those days? Like now, oh, well, I'll have an Evian water. I'm going, well, I'd really like a bit. Oh, for God's <laughs> sake, Tara, are you sure? <laughs> so, yeah, we had so many, some of the best ideas, certainly for Tiswas. And actually, some of the better thoughts about Millionaire came from bars. You know? Now, speaking of Millionaire, one of the stories that you do tell in the book is over the man who we saw, your, your nemesis, you might say, Charles Ingram, the, the man who thought that he had tricked you as, as mm -hmm. the coffee major. And you know over the past year, I'm sure you saw it, you know, you were portrayed in the big ITV drama. That was great. It was very well made. It was, but it cast a lot of doubt, Chris. It cast it a lot of doubt it about did. whether he was actually guilty. Yes, but, but you say guilty as, as Guy Fawkes. But, <laughs> but, 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 if you made a, tried to make a, a drama called, you know, Charles was guilty... Wouldn't be much of a show. At least we know that story. Yeah, no, that'd be interesting. We know that one. It was proven in court, whatever. What they did, and they did it very well. And Mike, Mike, what, sitting at home watching Michael Sheen is a very weird experience because he's being me. <laughs> did he do a good job? He did a good... He didn't do the best possible job on The Voice. But like a load of the impressionists do all that, hello, Chris Tarrant, he! <laughs> he didn't do any of that. He's an actor. He's a brilliant actor. But what he did was this, this surreal um, body language of mine because he's... Our poor devil, he's watched hours of tapes of me doing weird things with my arms. There's one bit where I sort of, I hold, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm holding a contestant like that to sort of get them on the set. And I do a sort of, I don't know what, it's, it's very odd. And I said to Jane, my missus, do I actually do that? She went, yep, you do that every single time. And my son said, yeah, Dad, you do And there's all sorts of weird things. It was quite surreal, but, blah, blah, blah. Helen McCrory, fantastic, mm. the late Splint, great actress. Brilliant actress. She, put, she played the defence QC and they did a fantastic summing up and went from that to the judge, to the jury, to the verdict. They didn't, and this was obviously quite deliberate, and the one thing I sort of said to the producers, hang on, that's a bit, you know, that's unnecessary because it really is slanting it. And they did the same in the, in the uh, stage play. They did no prosecution sum up at all, which you... You probably never really realised that. You think, oh, no, they didn't, did they? No. When we did the real, the real court, and I went for the last day again for the sum up, the prosecution dragged in all the strands of all the phone calls to tech and all the different things and whatever. And really, it was like, so you must find all three of them guilty, which of course they did. What was quite interesting to me is, is you say in the book, it, you, you, you didn't initially realise, but the moment uh, one of your, I think it was one of your producers, uh, approached you after the show, you just internally thought, aha. No, that's not true. You see, you did speed read. I, I've always said I yeah. did not spot anything at the time. There was so... No, exactly, but when she came and spoke to you after the show, I knew. No, no, no. Go back and read another page. Because 
I've always said I didn't spot anything. Yeah. That, that show was one of the wildest TV shows I've ever done yes. in my life. Because people were screaming, oh, my God, what's he doing? Applauding, oh, gasping and all that. People were coughing, people were coughing in studios. So I didn't see anything. I went up to see the director and said, yes. great, weird guy, but another million. She went, not sure, not sure. I said, come on, said, no, there's something wrong. And I left and went home. They then, the Diana, Cruella and uh, <laughs> Cruella and Charles, had this massive rock in the dressing room, like you do when you just yeah, want a million yeah. quid. My manager, Paul's going, oh, I wish I'd listened to the wall with a glass. They're having this massive rock, which is weird. Then they drove home, didn't buy anybody a drink, and the owners of the company all sat round with his tape saying, what's he doing? What's he... He's doing something that doesn't fit the pattern, which he didn't. You know, he had one lifeline left at 4,000. Someone got to a million. And they went right through it. Nothing happened. Couldn't see anything. He's doing something. And they, they put it on again. And about quarter to two in the morning, a young editor went, there's a cough there. Went, what? It's a cough. And they then went back and went, oh, my God. And all the way through. It's been had. The fraud squad came in about 4 a.m. and agreed there is a case to answer. I was wheeled in the next day and I sat through it and, God, how stupid am I? But, you know, I was focused on this guy. Who, so wants, to be a, who, who wants to be in a millionaire is, is back now. Mm. It, it's back on ITV. Uh, were you asked to do it? No, I finished. Done it. And was that difficult for you to see it? with someone else? This Jeremy Clarkson. This is a terrible thing, and I have no problem with Jeremy at all. I mean, socially, I see the guy quite a lot, yeah. and I like him. I've never watched one. Because, because it would feel too weird? No, just because I actually don't watch game shows. I mean, I only watched two. of. I did about 700. I only watched two. Ever? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to race home and put, you know, I, I watch Netflix, and obviously you... And, uh, Every yeah, night, you, know what I mean. you thought this show was at 10.20 in I the morning, I so I morning. think that's a little lie. <laughs> now, tonight. Um, I haven't watched one. Should I? I don't know. Maybe. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? For me, I think we're losing, again, a bit of creativity in the entertainment industry. Now, sometimes you actually just want something to be great and remain in the past, but it's with the same thing with yeah. movies now, isn't it? Yeah. Everything is rebooted. If very few things now are an original idea. I resent the fact that an awful lot of you know, TV executives go all expenses paid for three months to Los Angeles to view American television and come back and say, I think we'll have one more series of The Generation Game or whatever. The same old stuff. Because you, know? you think we should do something new? Yeah, of course we should. I it's... mean, how many years has... I love Anton Decker superb, mm. but how many more years of Britain's Got Talent are we going to watch? Yeah. Well, what was great about yeah. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? What, 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 what was it, 98, 98, yeah, when, it, when it was first broadcast? It was at that time genuinely innovative because game shows were completely out of fashion. I know. They, they were I know. gone. And, and we need sometimes someone to come in and do something completely but new. But we always say it's, it's not a game show, it's a drama, because it was. These people in this yeah. huge close-up. And you can see their lips trembling. Like, oh, God, she's going to go for it. Oh, please don't. I mean, that's what I'm looking at, you know. Well, it was look, an amazing show. What a career. 50 years yes, all in right, television. Dan. 50 years. How, how, how much longer do you have, Chris? You're never going to retire? Weeks. Never going to retire? No, I haven't retired. I've just sort of slowed down a bit. I'm having, I'm having a really nice life at the moment, you know, so I'm cool. Look, it's a brilliant book. I absolutely loved it, and it's so great. To My pleasure. Chris, nice thank to see you, Thank you mate. so much. Broadcasting legend, Christopher Tarrant.